Are people able to see captions? Okay, thanks, Cal. Yeah, sometimes the captions can, <laughs> I'm using Spanish or Spanglish. <laughs> we got, I've seen some crazy things like that is not what I was saying. <laughs> I know they're getting better and better, but yeah, there's, mm -hmm, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Okay. Okay, wonderful. I think I'll start with my introduction. Folks are still, oh, actually, let's see. Jake, let me make you a co-host. And that way, if you want, or if folks are in the waiting room, you can let them in while I'm talking, or I can, I'm fairly adept at managing both. So um, yeah, welcome everyone. I think, uh, I know most of you, I'm Katie Dichter. I use she, her pronouns. This is COSI, Conversations on Social Issues. I am a faculty librarian at Seattle Central. Today, folks will be coming from around the district and also, um, there were lots of invitations sent out from Humanities Washington. So hopefully we get some community members as well, could be from all over the state. Um, and I am super excited for our opening COSI of the quarter. Uh, I will also say, I think lots of you know this as well, but I like to kind of um, honor the lineage of COSI, which is that we started COSIs through the library during Occupy, um, which I think is 10 years ago. And Kelly McHenry, a librarian at the time, started to host these on a weekly basis. Kimberly Tate Malone, who was a librarian at Central and now is at North Seattle College, continued. Um, and then even into COVID, we went online mostly. We're still online. Maybe someday we'll go back to the library at Central. but. Um, this is a long, long and honored event in the district. Um, so thank you all for being here with us. Uh, COSI today is sponsored by Humanities Washington's Speaker Bureau, Speakers Bureau program. Humanities Washington is giving funding to the speaker um, and helping us market the event. Their aim is sparking conversation and critical thinking, which closely aligns with our aims for COSI, so it's a perfect match. There's a Humanities Washington feedback form that I'll put in the chat in a minute that might be different than the one you've seen before. So, okay, I wanna get most the most time for Jake. Jake, thank you for coming. Um, this is Jake Prendes. Jake uses he, him pronouns and is a renowned Chicano artist in Seattle. Um, Jake is the owner and co-director of Nepantla Cultural Arts Gallery. You should visit them. Um, it is in Seattle's White Center neighborhood, so um, close to many of us. Jake's work is an amalgamation of his life experiences, a representation of his Chicano background, and a reflection of his time living in Seattle and Los Angeles. Jake, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna give it, give the floor to you. Thank you. So happy to be here, and thank you, everyone, for showing up and um, listening to me today. Um, so the title of the presentation is "The Art of Rebellion: Social Justice and Chicano, Chicano Visual Arts." Um, what I'm gonna do is talk about how art has been used to mobilize communities to um, further messages of social justice, um, and how that the means of the production has changed over the years, but this idea of um, using art to disseminate information and spread message social justice has kind of remained and where those links are kind of through generations. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my own artwork and just talk, you know, deconstruct what I've created um, kind of with the knowledge of what I just talked about since, you know, I don't operate in a bubble, my art is informed and inspired by those that came before me. So if that sounds good to everyone, I'll go ahead and um, share screen and we can go ahead and get started.
All right. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to I'm going to start with Mexican muralism um, and just kind of with the side note that revolutionary art and you know doesn't begin here what I'm I'm using Mexican muralism as as a springboard um but you so you have to think about Mexico in the 19 to 1920s during the Mexican Revolution as you know a much different place than it is today um Mexico was seen more as nation states versus this kind of unified Mexican country we know of today. So after the Mexican Revolution, one of the things that they wanted to do was create that unified identity of, of, of Mexico. And one of the things that they did is they enlisted um, Jose Vasconcelos, who was a secretary of public education, to kind of create, create this, you know, some program, something that's going to help us create this cohesive, unified sense of country. And so what Vasconcelos does is hires muralists from around the country to create these murals in public spaces. So, um, you know, in, in, you know, on public buildings, in public administrative buildings. Um, and so when they first start doing these murals, they're very steeped in um like indigenous iconography, kind of our, our indigenous roots. And, um, but very quickly, the artists that are kind of enlisted to be, you know, the, the muralists are left-leaning, um, some of them socialist uh, artists. And that comes out in the art they create. So very quickly, you see a kind of a shift from this kind of indigenismo to talking a little bit more about what's happening in the country and current events. And at the time, it was a lot about the um, Industrial Revolution and workers' rights. So you see a very strong like workers' rights message in a lot of these murals. Now, the three main muralists at this time, um, known as Los Tres Grandes, are David Alfaro Siqueiros, Jose Clemente Orozco, and Diego Rivera. Um, now, the one thing I, I want to mention before I kind of show their art is the way we look at art shifted with Mexican muralism, right? Up until then, art was really seen as a commodity, something you could own. So, that you know, the richest kings and noble people, right, could hire these artists to create family portraits or self-portraits. So it was very much seen as a commodity where muralism shifted that paradigm to this is for the people. This is not owned by one person. Um, anyone that comes to this wall can see this art and is going to get the message that the artist is trying to purvey, right? So these are Los Tres Grandes. So you have from left to right, it's David Alfaro Siqueiros, Jose Clemente Orozco in the middle, and Diego Rivera on the right. And we'll start with Diego Rivera, who is most famous for being Frida Kahlo's husband, but he, you know, he did some other things too. Um, but what I love about this mural particularly, it really shows that shift from indigenismo, and talk about you know, our, our indigenous roots, to kind of the industrial revolution and workers' rights. So you literally see in the middle of this mural, the uh, Aztec statue of Colique, the mother, mother god. And on one side, it's the statue. And on the other side, it's a machine. And he's talking about the mechanization of the country, right? Um, you have workers, you have indigenous folk in this mural. So I, I love that it just really, it's like in this, where I'm talking about they move from indigenism to workers' rights. Like, okay, literally illustrates this in one mural, and I appreciate that. He made my life a lot easier. Um, and then you have uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros. So David Alfaro Siqueiros and Diego Rivera were staunch socialists. Um, 
And David, David Alfaro Seeker literally paints Karl Marx like in the front of his painting. He's not shy about it. Um, so this mural you like to have on one side, you have kind of uh, Marxist, socialist kind of uprising. You have kind of Karl, Karl Marx in there. You have um, uh, other like, um, like Maragon. And then in the middle, it's like the people, the uprising against kind of tyranny folks. And then on the right, you have the original Zapatistas with Emiliano Zapata coming in. And so it's this like unification of different folks coming together to kind of uprise against tyranny and those you know that are oppressing the people. Now, out of the three, Jose Clemente Orozco was not a socialist. He saw socialism the same way he looked at religion, the same way he looked at like Nazism. They're all problematic. Um, and so this mural, if you can, hopefully you can see, um, you have this kind of um, Hildalgo's El Grito that kind of was the call to action um, for the Mexican revolution. But you have kind of this like bowels of hell section, right? And in there, you see people holding a Christian cross, you see the hammer and sickle, you see the swastika. So he's really saying like all of these folks are problematic. Um, and and he, he throws it in one mural. Now what happens is Mex it, these Mexican muralists are hired to teach across the United States. Um, so they're teaching kind of quarter semesters, years, at a university getting hired to do some murals in the United States. And they start influencing this kind of next generation of artists in the United States who will become known as our social realist artists. Now, at the time they weren't called social realist artists. That term was coined in the seventies to describe them. But, um, but this is kind of uh, the social realism era kind of was, um, an art movement encompassing the workers and painters, muralists, photographers, filmmakers who drew attention to everyday conditions of the working class and poor. So I think what's really key about this era was making the working class, the poor, seen as that having value, having agency, having um, uh, honor, really. It wasn't cleaned up. It was still like kind of nitty gritty and it wasn't polished, but it should still showed these folks with kind of this sense of honor and value. Um, and so what happens is if you studied in history class and you know all about the, you know, the New Deal and FDR, um, part of that was the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. And through, so this was like kind of putting America back to work. Um, you know, creating, you know, building highways and, you know, infrastructure across the country. And part of it was putting artists back to work. And so through the WPA was the federal arts um, program. And so they hired artists to create screenplays, propaganda posters to um, do all this art. And part of that was murals in public places. Literally like, hey, what they're doing in Mexico really worked. So let's let's try that here. Um, so, you know, post offices and public buildings and things like that were being adorned with these um, murals by American artists that were influenced directly many times by Mexican muralists. Many of them actually studied under these artists while they were touring and teaching in the United States. Um, some of them became their protégés. Um, so for example, there's an artist that um, Pablo O'Higgins, um, he used to be Peter O'Higgins, but he started studying under Diego Rivera. He's like, man, I'm changing my name to Pablo O'Higgins. And, uh, and so he did some murals out here and actually ends up going to Mexico and um, staying with Diego Rivera and, and doing a bunch of murals out there and living his life out there. But he did a mural locally for a union shipyard. Um, and when that, Later on, when that building was torn down, they saved the mural 
and it was um, like donated to the University of Washington. It was in storage for a few decades. And then I think it was in the early 2000s, students discovered this mural in storage and demanded that it be put back out on display. So if you go into Kane Hall, there's a big mural when you walk into Kane Hall and that was painted by Pablo Higgins during this, um, this era. And, uh, and every once in a while, I'll, I'll go mail a package somewhere and I'll still see, like they still have this original, you know, uh, social realist era mural in their post office. And, um, and I'll geek out. I'm like, oh my God. This is... And um, people are like, hey, shut up and buy your stamps. I'm like, oh, that's right. Um, so again, just like Mexican muralists, social realist artists, they get a little older and they start teaching at universities. They start inspiring the next generation of artists and teaching them. Mexican muralism and social realism very are very similar, right? It's taking your message, putting it on a wall for the people, right? And it, um, but when you start getting to the kind of this next generation, uh, oh, here's some real quick, just some examples of social realist art. Um, so you can kind of see this idea of showing the working class and the poor as heroic and with agency and um, not weak. But when you get to the civil rights era, something shifts, right? The, and that is in the production of the art. Um, does anyone want to chime in and just say what's different about this art? And, I'm, and again, I'm talking about medium. What's different about this than the murals? Anyone can chime in. I'll chime in. Okay. This is Katie. Are they posters? So something transferable yes. and not attached yes. to a wall. Exactly. So screen printing becomes in vogue when we get to kind of the civil rights era art. So what we've done is we've literally taken the message off the wall and into the hands of the people. So with screen printing, it's still mass produced. So it's not, you know, it's still keeping with this idea of art for the people and not kind of this commodity. You mass produce these pieces, oftentimes just given away at a protest. Um, and yeah, so you can make a bunch of prints, take it to a protest, or you can ship them to somebody. So your message is reaching a larger audience now, a wider audience. And um and yeah so it's, again spring screen printing becomes in vogue and in these examples you see you know boycott grace with united farm workers struggle in the middle you have a piece from emory douglas um this emory douglas he was the um i believe secretary of propaganda something like he, he worked he ran the uh, black panther party newspaper and, uh, but he was this amazing artist and people would collect the Black Panther paper for like the new Emory Douglas piece. So they, they'd be excited like, oh my God, is the new piece in, in this issue? Um, so it became very popular. And then you have Who's the Illegal Alien Pilgrim by um, Yolanda Lopez. And I added this one because Yolanda Lopez just passed away last year. And she really was, um, amazing and, you know, pioneering as far as Chicana art. Um, and I read somewhere that she, when she passed away, she had a solo exhibition going on. And I read somewhere that that was her first solo exhibition. And she wasn't young. She, she was like 80s, I think. So it took her that long to get her own solo show. And that breaks my heart. But I'm glad she got it before she passed. Um, all right, so when you get to the next era, it's it's really the same thing. It's um, these folks start teaching, they start influencing the next generation of artists. And when you get to contemporary poster protest art, you definitely see the influence, but again, there's something that's shifted in the way, um, in the means of the art. 
And should I try again to see if anyone, <laughs> I don't know if everyone's muted and they can't chime in or, oh, someone, I think someone about to. I'll give it one more second here. If you know what can tell what's different about this art versus screen printing, let me know. I'm gonna take a sip so, of my coffee. Jake, yeah. I don't know if you can see the chat. And of course, mm. take a sip of your coffee. Um, Willow says in the chat, social media, and Ukuni says digital, Angela says digital, and Brink says digital versus printing. Well, they're Sorry. all brilliant and they are all correct. So what becomes in vogue now is um, digitizing art. So some of this is computer generated art, right? They do it on their computer. Some of it is still a screen print, right? But what they're doing is they're digitizing their art, right? So where we put the art from the wall to the hands of the people, what we've done now is taking that another step, another jump really with social media. So now your message of social justice is international. It's global. It's not just who you can hand this piece to, but it, um, your message now is instantly international. So, and we've seen how important that is. I think the Zapatistas were one of the first groups that really used social media and online, um, you know, methods, you know, to really sp spread their message and get global support for what was happening in, in Chiapas. Now you see with Iran, you've seen in China, you've seen um, all these places that are giving these like live updates. What is happening right now? We're being attacked. This is happening. Um, and so a real quick example, in Mexico City, they have an amazing mural movement. Um, it just gorgeous murals, but unlike Los Angeles who, has these long, you know, Los Angeles being kind of the mural mecca of the world right now. Um, there's money that is like restoration budgets and things like that from the city to keep these murals clean and updated and ungraffitied. In Mexico City, these murals are whitewashed in probably a week or so, right? So longitude is not their strategy. They get those murals up on the wall and then post those on social media. So their murals are living virtually versus, you know, something that you can see. So they have all their links and everything like that. And these have million followers and they're huge virtual artists basically. So um, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna whip through my art real quick and just talk about how I've been influenced by these. Um, so I did some murals in Guanajuato, Mexico, and had an amazing time and just was so influenced by what was happening um, in the city and, you know, the indigenous communities I was working with. Um, and it really, I think, transformed my art from creating these, you know, my early works were, you know, pop stars, you know, painting Beatles or The Clash or Run DMC or things, you know, some I like to kind of having a little more ideology and thought behind them. Um, and so I did this series shortly after I returned. Um, it's called Cultural Resilience, We Still Exist. And it was just in response to hearing folks talk about indigenous communities, like we're an extinct people. We're not extinct, we're still here. Uh, we might not dress exactly like our ancestors, but our culture survives in the way we cook, the way we dance, the way we raise our children, work with our elders, that culture has survived and it's passed down generation after generation. So what I did with these paintings was I painted portraits of families and family and friends. The one in the Seahawk jersey is my son. Um, and then what I did were these like Aztec symbols over their portraits to kind of represent this invisible culture we walk around with every day. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll say too, I, I went to a quinceanera recently and I noticed like, you know, when, when folks were dancing, I was like, my God, if we just 
muted the music and did like Aztec drumming. The boom, 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 boom. It like still would go. And I was like, that is in our DNA. Like that rhythm is is still with us. All right, this was like a humor humorous um, series I did called Dulces. And so the one on the left, you have my friend Omar with the mazapan candy in the background. That one's called I Fall to Pieces. If you've ever eaten mazapan, you know uh, why that's called the I Fall to Pieces. The one in the middle, middle is my friend Sipatli. And the one, it has the crossing churros in the background. And that one's called Churro Know My Life. And then the one on the right is my daughter, and uh, it's got the concha in the background, and that one's Don't Be Self-Conchas. And um, I tease my daughter because she's really shy and quiet. I'm like, mija, you're literally the poster child for Don't Be Self-Conchas, and you're self-conchas. She's like, I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, this series is called Mujeres Fuertes. Um, and strong women. And so you, the one on the left is called Be Still My Corazon. And um, she represents love in all its forms. So I tell the viewer, if you feel great about love, she's offering her heart. If you feel crappy about love, she's ripped your heart out. So I'll let the, the interpreter um, interpret how they like. The one in the middle, uh, it's kind of life goes on. It's just a little more about the environment, kind of Mother Earth. And the whole thing with the shoe and the nopal, uh, it's a little nod to Wally, if you remember that Pixar movie. Uh, they're trying to save the boo with the little plant growing out. And I thought, well, what's the most Chicano shoe out there? Chucks. And I'll just make the nopal coming out of the, the chuck. And then the last one is Artista, and she just represents the arts. And I got one of my favorite artists to model for me. That's Emilia Cruz. She is amazing and she, I don't, I think she's like 26 or something. And I'm just like, oh, screw you for being so good, so young. Um, but if you ever watch that show, Hentified on Netflix, the daughter on the show is this like Chicana artist. They actually use Emilia's artwork um, for the show. So it's actually her art. All right. So this series is called Contemporary Codices. I just, had the idea of like if we were still creating these codices like our ancestors what would they look like today so i try to capture everyday community but in this style of the codices and so you have kind of the black lives matter protesters with the solidarity you have in the middle like two graduating um students you have the palatero the ice cream man um i have one of a girl taking a selfie you have a break dancer i have a mariachi i have a an artist, I have um, a bunch of different father and daughter, a bunch of different ones that are part of this series. Um, but it, again, it's just trying to capture everyday community in the style of our ancestors. Now this one I just wanted to throw into kind of, I did a, um, the painting on the left, I, it was one of my first ever paintings. So I did this, I think in 2008. And um, I was really, I really love the concept of it, but execution, not so much. So the idea is that it's called genetic memory, uh, chinachli to so chil. So the Mayan is holding the symbol chinachli, which means seed, and the little girl's holding the symbol for flower, so chil. So the idea is that our ancestors have planted these seeds that bloomed the flowers with us, the seventh generation, which seventh generation is an important number because we didn't look at what was good for us or our kids but we made decisions based on seven generations out. So again, I like the concept, but I, you know, I was like, uh, her head's too big. I didn't like the shading, all that. So a few years ago, I revisited this painting um, with my youngest daughter um, and it kind of made it a little more conceptual, like the Mayans kind of painted on the wall that she's walking by and instead of holding the symbol for flower, she's actually holding a flower. So she is the flower of our ancestors. Um, she is the hopes and the dreams and everything that we hope, you know, seven generations out would be. And there's some other examples of some of my newer work. Um, the guy flying in space, the title of that one is The Floor is Racism. So he's just trying to get as far away from racism and hate, and he's up in outer space. And that's part of a series I'm working on, um, kind of a superhero it's like part superhero, it's part social realism. 
and it's part magical realism, right? But it's showing the everyday person as super and heroic, right? Um, all right, and then you have the two luchadores, which is actually me and my son when he was like seven. Um, it's one of my favorite photos, and he's 25 and doing his. He just started his PhD at UW, so I'm going through that whole. I miss when he was a baby, um, so I wanted to uh, capture that. The one uh, with the little hummingbirds and the butterfly wings. That one's called a little prayer for those who migrate, and the hummingbirds represent our ancestors. So this is during the caravans, and um, so the hummingbirds, the ancestors are guiding her along her journey. The butterfly wings represent migration. And the title is just a kind of a double entendre of she's literally a little prayer. She's someone who's praying, but it's also she's given a little prayer. And then the last one, La Nina, that's my friend's daughter, Naomi. She showed me this picture. I was like, that is the cutest picture ever. I have to paint it. And um, it was Round de los Huertos. So I just added the kind of de los Huertos makeup and kind of made it like a, um, every year I do a de los Huertos painting. That was that year. And then the last paint I want to show you is just kind of the progression of a painting. Um, so you have kind of the sketch, then you have the kind of undercoating. Usually when I'm at that undercoating stage is where I hate my painting and I'm like, oh, that sucks. I'm going to throw it out the window. And then once I start putting in the highlights and shadows, it starts popping better. It has more dimension. You add the background. And then the last step with this one was with a white paint pen adding those symbols. And it was kind of a nerve wracking because I have this completed painting that I'm happy with. Now I'm gonna take this like permanent paint pen. And if, you know, and sometimes those things will like just leak and you're doing something like, you're like, oh. So I was like, oh, please don't leak, please don't leak, you know, or mess up on, you know. So I was happy, nothing went wrong and that completed the painting. All right. Um, lastly, I want to invite you to visit us, whether it's virtually or in person. Um, the Napantla Cultural Arts Gallery, we're the only Latino, Chicana Chicano public art space in the Pacific Northwest. That's crazy to say, but it's true. Um, we're in the White Center neighborhood. Every month we have a new exhibition focused on marginalized communities, communities of color. Um, we have an amazing gift shop with things like concha pillows and chingona t-shirts and mazapan earrings and all that cool stuff. Um, you can follow us on Instagram or you can just follow my personal art page um, and then the website for both. And then you can buy prints and canvases and, you know, postcards and stickers and all that stuff from actually both websites. It's the same shopping cart. Um, but we really hope you can visit us because we also have... Um, we usually do like two to three free art workshops for community as well. So um, our mission is to make art an accessible experience. And um, yeah, so come visit us, whether it's for a workshop, whether it's to shop or whether it's to check out one of our art exhibitions. Um, we love to see you all in person. And that is all of my presentation. So um, now I wanna just open it up for, um, like a Q&A, just get some conversation going. Um, but I, I wanna, a lot of times I think it's hard to get that conversation going. Um, you know, I, I don't wanna like ask any questions and then here see a tumbleweed going by or something. So I'm gonna do a little prompt, um, but how has art touched your life personally? So does anyone want to, share how art has made an impact, touch their life in a meaningful way. Okay, let me put that question in the chat and I'll just read what I wrote in the chat, which is, you can raise your hand, you can write in the chat, or you can just unmute and answer. So the question that Jake asked is, how has art, can you repeat it for me, Jake? Mm -hmm. How has art impacted your life? Um, you know, how has art made a meaningful impact or changed your life? 
Got it. Okay, Deepa, go for it. Also, Deepa, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. And I really appreciate, um, Jake. Yeah, your presentation was just amazing. Um, Thank you. Our library staff is, yeah, amazing fellow faculty um, who bring community to our college. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, just personally for me, um, I'm not um, a visual artist. I'm an admirer um, of the visual arts. And I think one of the reasons, like I'm just looking, you know, at, at your presentation, I'm reminded of um, my grandmother who was a, a visual artist and um, whose art hangs like in my, my parents' home and was one of the first people um, who helped me see myself in art. Um, so I grew up here in the US, I was born in Chicago, grew up in Ohio. And, you know, like a lot of us was taken to the art museum as a kid and saw a lot of European art um, mm -hmm. and like paintings of bodies that didn't resemble the bodies of me and my family and community. And so I think to just see, to start to make the connection, um, that was important to me and to see that I like, yeah, that, that art is for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell a quick story. I, I use, so usually this presentation is like a uh, hour long and I add other things in there. I had to kind of condense, but, um, the story I usually tell is, kind of why there's a Nepantla, why I, I do this. There was a family that came into the gallery and it was the mother, father, uh, two kids and the abuelito, the grandfather. Now everyone was excited to be there. The grandfather looked like he got dragged there that day. Like that was not his first choice. And, um, you know, they're all shopping. I've kind of looked away. I was doing some other stuff and I look back and I see him looking at the, my art on the wall and he had this huge grin on his face and it hit me like this is probably the first time he's been in an art space that had art that reflected him that spoke to him that looked like him looked like family members of his and you know this wasn't a, you know a kid like this is a viejito like and it really made it that's impact he's like we need to be seen in these spaces. We need to feel represented in these spaces. I just got done working with the Seattle Art Museum. We revamped the American collection. So I was on the committee that did that to make it more of an inclusive um, you know, space that reflected not just kind of this Eurocentric male um, you know, art that we're used to. And I, I we made strides. I don't think it's perfect, but um, but there's some representation in there. There's a piece by Alfredo Aragin, who's this guy's in the Smithsonian, yet not a lot of people in Seattle know who he is. So thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Jake, there's some stuff in the chat that I will read okay, because you. I love it. Um, Sandy Long at South says, Public art has emotionally moved me and I marvel at pieces everywhere around me and advertising art on products in the store. It gives me a wide range of emotions. Brink says it makes life worth living. It inspires emotion, thought, conversation, and so much more. Um, Danielle, and then Nicole, I don't know if you saw my message. What you posted in the chat went directly to me, so I'm happy to read it. I don't know if that was on purpose, but let me know if you'd like me to read it. Um, Daniela says, um, it has changes your views and you could feel emotions through art. Yes, totally agree. And Deepa says, thanks for your story, Jake, and the important work you're doing at SAM, which I second. Yeah, decolonize art. Oh, and Nicole says, yes, read, please. Okay. So the last chat I'll read for now, and then I'll give some space for feedback or response. Sometimes we aren't always confident in putting ourselves in public or the pressure is a lot and you mess up or whatever it is. Art is space and time to express and only show to people when you're ready to. Thanks for that, Nicole. Okay, Angela. 
Angela, who has also blown up the chat with so many amazing things. Thank you, Angela. Go ahead. Hey there. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of the Butler. I live just down the street. Uh, oh, thank near you. College, actually. Um, so I grew up in a family of artists, but not a visual art. My dad is a musician and my whole family is very musical. Um, that gene skipped me entirely, unfortunately. Um, but I, you know, art has been a big part of my life. I can, I don't consider myself an artist. I probably should, but I also come from a mixed race background. So my mom and my family comes from Mexico and my dad is white. And I grew up here in Seattle. This is home for me, but, you know, um, galleries and, uh, you know, cultural art has been a way for me to connect with my family and my ancestors in a place where there's really not a lot of representation outwardly. There's a huge community here that we're a part of, um, but it's been a way for me to embrace that and learn more. And it's just, it's so encouraging. Um, and I was so lucky. We actually went to the first Lowrider Block Party. Oh, uh, cool. Well, we've been to both, but at the first <laughs> one, my daughter saw the Folklorico dancers. And I always wanted to do that growing up. Um, but, you know, I had a single mom who couldn't afford it. And I, she's a dancer now with Hoyas. Oh, nice. And, so I am definitely living vicariously through her, but she loves it. So I'm not pushing her to do it, but it's just, it's mm. such a, it's a wonderful connection, you know, whether it's visual art or dance or music to the past, even if you're not physically there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, uh, we're good friends with a lot of the Hoyas families and mm -hmm. um, I just, did a painting for Luna's mom who passed away mm -hmm. and uh, just gave the paint, the original to the family. And so definitely tell them I said, hi. I will. We've got uh, practice tonight. She's still, oh. my daughter's only six. She's not quite in the group. She's just in the yeah. classes, but she will be, we'll, we're a dance family. Oh, it, oh you, you're in for the long haul. Sorry. Yep. To like. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, one thing I'll say real quick too, and I'll try to be quick. Um, my story and how I got involved in art, I always loved art. And I bet a lot of you can, I, you know, re reflect on this or identify with this, that, you know, I love drawing and all that in elementary and, you know, through high school. And by the, you know, I'm dyslexic. And um, so I did horribly in school. It was undiagnosed. Um, the school didn't want to pay for the testing. So they just stuck me in like special help classes. So I grew up with a very low self-esteem. I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I hate school. Art was like the one thing I was good at and got, got, got praise for. So I loved creating art. But by the time I was in middle school, high school, I was kind of the cholo, the at-risk youth. And I remember my teachers telling me my art was too ethnic, too gangster. You can't do that kind of art. I quit. And so, and then I, you know, I did community college and like my first semester, I took some art class and heard the same feedback. And I quit creating art from the time I was 18 till the time I was 30, because I listened to those negative people that told me my art wasn't good art. It wasn't, you know, was gangster and ethnic. I took a painting class. It was part of my Chicano studies. I did a master's in Chicano studies and it was an elective. It was a painting class. It was a Chicano studies class, but it was painting and just absolutely fell in love with art all over again. And I've been painting ever since. This is probably 12, 13 years ago. And so I bring this up because you, you can't listen. One, you can't listen to those negative people that, you know, those soul crushers. But two, art is so important. And one of the reasons why we do these workshops for the families and not just the youth is because we all need art as a means of of healing as a means of expression right a friend of mine said once i was an at-risk youth and then i turned to 18 and then i was just an at-risk adult like but those services stopped but nothing changed and so we want to make sure that we're you know so as adults we still have trauma we still have things that we need to work through and art is such a transformational, powerful way of dealing with all of that, right? 
So it was great for me when I was a little cholo kid trying to express the anger and all these things that were happening in my life at the time. Um, and then it was kind of robbed from me for so long. And so now that I have it back, I can still kind of channel like when I went through a divorce, it, art was there for me. And it was such a healing way to get through that. Um, so, yeah, it, it we all need art. It, it's beautiful and it's great, but it's also just such a powerful tool, whether it's just self-healing or healing society. Angela has posted more information about dance. Oh, yeah, the Hoyas Mestizos. Yeah, if anyone has kids that want to learn folklorical dancing, definitely. They're a great organization. And the folks, the staff folks that are with them are so sweet and nice and, um, and patient with the youth. My daughter, you can go over here. You can see the art on my wall. Those are all my kids. Um, and then... You turn this up. the one in the corner is when my daughter was in Hoyas Mestizas, and that's she's in her little outfit. I I will say that um, I'm thinking about the Black Lives Matter mural that was painted on the street in that's like a block from the central campus. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what every, everyone is saying. And what you're saying, Jake, about trauma, um, I think that, you know, that mural was born from spring 2020 and the uprisings and that I, I think we probably all have a lot of really close, um, visceral, heartfelt emotions around what happened in our community and in the world um, from that time. And I'm glad it's there because we need it to stay there to remind us. As you think about what happened in that neighborhood, that, that's where Chaz and Chop was really for an extended period of time in mm -hmm. Cal Anderson Park, right across the street from our campus. And then the city government and business leaders in Capitol Hill and potentially administrators at our college central had those folks removed. Um, that it's really important for us to, to remember that and to have art that mm -hmm. stays on and so that we can, you know, have a daily visual reminder of these important things that we lived through. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and there's, oh, Monica, yes. Hi there. Um, I did put, I already put it in chat. I was just saying, Jake, I gave my brother, father, and son uh, for Christmas a print of it and he loved it. So thank you for making oh, that. Awesome. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, it's uh, a father and son both in lucha masks, Mexican wrestler masks. Um, and then I just wanted to share with everyone, I don't know, Jake, if you even know this, I don't know if Humanities Washington has been talking to you about this. So I was a speaker uh, on the Speakers Bureau for Humanities Washington years ago. And I was hired most recently um, as one of their fellows to create some curriculum around talks. Uh, it's called Democracy Forward. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is interested in having Jake speak to a class, if you're an educator, it, it was really looking at high school classes, but I think um, first two years of college might also work. Um, and you're interested in having Jake come and talk and then maybe some curriculum to support that. Um, let me know and give me some information. Um, so I, I wanted to ask Jake just a little bit about this. So when um, you were talked to about being included in the Democracy Forward, or my, at that point, point, it might have been called Democracy Track. What were you, what were your thoughts about being included in that, and how your work sort of lends itself to these conversations around around democracy? Yeah, well, I think you know I do a lot of talks with like high school, middle school, like tour groups see they're coming in, I'll do a classroom presentation. Um, this presentation is a little more the one I'll do for 
um, universities and organizations, the ones like a little more scholarly. Um, I don't want to bore the students. So, um, yeah, so I was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is something I'm already doing. Um, and then working with, you know, you know, doing my master's in Chicano Chicago studies and being in that academia setting and and then working with um, ethnic studies now and linking on the name of the organization, but there's like a Rasa studies kind of organization that I do some stuff with. So I was like, oh yeah, this is something I'm comfortable doing already. I would love to, you know, continue to support in this, in this way as well. Um, you know, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a man on a mission. I, I gotta, <laughs> and I, I mean, maybe some of the, the folks here can, you know, if you've come from other places um, and you move to Seattle, it can be quite a culture shock, right? Um, and, you know, I was, you know, I was born in California out by Riverside, a um, little town called San Jacinto, um, but I was raised in Bothell, which is Bothell in the 80s. Oh my God. Like, um, and then moved back to LA for 15 years um, to do my master's and then just stayed. And I always felt off here. Like I always felt different and weird and kind of, and when I moved back to LA and being around this large Latinx Chicano, Chicano community, I felt like the, a circle peg that fit in a circle hole. Like it just, I was like, oh my God, all those things I felt weird were not. <laughs> and you can go to a place like AMPM and you can get cafe de olla and a dispenser. Like it, our culture so normalized. Like you can get pan dulce at like a Safeway type grocery store bakery. Like, and then you come back to Seattle and it's back to being othered. It's back to, you know, people not, even knowing what you are, I think um, that it blows your mind. Like you go from like have your culture being normalized to no one even knowing like your culture. And, and then being somewhere like there's like four like Chicano centered art gallery spaces in like LA, East LA area to like, moving here where there's none in Pacific Northwest. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I want, one of the things that was so great about LA and I tell people like my experience in East LA and the kind of Chicano art movement there, I felt like what I imagine the Harlem Renaissance felt like being surrounded around amazing intellectuals and writers and poets and artists and musicians that we're all on this like amazing level and they inspire you to create better work because you see something say uh, Ernesto Irena creates or a uh, Rick Ortega or uh, Emilia Cruz and you're like, oh my God, like I have to create something that's good or better than that now. And so you're always pushing yourself and being inspired, right? And when I moved to Seattle, that's what I wanted here. I wanted to be inspired and work with others and right off the bat, I met some amazing artists. So the talent is here. What that wasn't the problem. It's just there was no space. Nothing brought us together. Um, and that's what I wanted to do with Nefantla was create this space that brought folks together. And as much as I love my gente, I love my culture, I still love other cultures, right? And I wanted to, you know, not just highlight. Latinx artists, but, you know, but marginalized communities in our gallery. So while most of our artists are of, you know, Latino uh, descent, um, we've had, you know, the, our Black in the Northwest art show, um, we've had queer art shows, we've had an all women's art show, we've had a Pacific Islander art show, um, you know, and then we just have themes, like this month is our Nuestros Sabores, which is, um, you know, like basically knowledge and learning, um, you know, our being is what it means, but like about knowledge and learning, uh, we had like a Frida art show, we had a low rider art show, right? So like everyone's in those. Um, and so, yeah, it's just 
a place where we feel represented, we feel embraced, we feel we can be our our weird selves. <laughs> um, and one thing I'll say too, last thing, I know I'm talking too much. Um, Napantla, what does that mean? Napantla is an Aztec word that means the space in between. So for example, me being Mexican-American, I'm not Mexican enough for Mexico, I'm not American enough for America, I'm in that Napantla space. It can be with queer identity. It can be with gender norms where you don't feel like you're here or there. You're in this kind of middle ground. Um, but in that Napantla space is where you heal, you rejuvenate, you create. And that's what we do at Napantla. So I was like, that would probably be a good name for our space. Um, and the term was popularized by Gloria Anzaldúa, a famous Chicana writer and uh, intellectual who passed away a while back, like 90s maybe. Um, but uh, her book, Borderlands, is an absolutely amazing book. If you have not read Borderlands, read that book. And that's, and when I was in college, that concept of Nabantla, reading that, it was like, finally, there was a word for how I felt and didn't know how to express. So, um, so yeah, it, that always stuck with me. And when we came to the, and the thing we're doing now is we just started a $15 million capital campaign to create the Nabantla Cultural Arts Center. This is going to be the massive art center and white center that's going to have, you know, it'll have the gallery, it'll have the gift shop, it'll have a coffee shop, but it's going to have um, affordable artist studios. It's going to have a performance center. It's going to have a technology center. It's going to have a big plaza area so we can do mercados, markets, and um, special events. Like we can do the lowrider block party inside, you know, in the plaza. Um, but this is going to be the first, you know, Latinx centered art center in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so we're, you know, off on a, it's going faster than I actually expected. And, you know, so hopefully in a few years, we're going to have this uh, cultural art center for the people. That's so awesome. So awesome. Um, and just so you know, that is in the curriculum. What is Napatla? We oh, talk about local muralists and uh, we even bring in a video about the Cheech, which if any oh. I to took my California. grandparents. Oh, you gotta check out the Cheech. It's amazing. I think that has to be kind of a cliffhanger. <laughs> what is the Cheech? Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're right up at the hour. I feel so energized and thrilled. I hope you all do too. I'm sorry for folks who put stuff in the chat that didn't get vocalized. Um, Jake. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate you all me. having me and listening to me ramble. That was, that was not rambling. Um, oh, well, okay. I do want to make sure that folks saw Casey posted. Want to be sure that everyone is aware of a call for a mural design currently open to Latinx artists for a mural at North Seattle campus to be painted by art students in spring 2023. Applications accepted through Sunday, January 5th. Here's the application form I'll post again in the chat. Um, thank you, Casey, for letting us know about that. And um, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for contributing your ideas and your thoughts. And I think the next COSI is in three weeks. So we'll see you then. All right. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Bye, Sean. Bye, everyone. Bye.